Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 7 Consolations of Purgatory, The Angels Besides the consolations which souls receive from the Blessed Virgin, they are also assisted and consoled by their holy angels, and especially by their guardian angels. The doctors of the Church teach that the tutelary mission of the guardian angels terminates on the entrance of their clients into paradise. If at the moment of death a soul in the state of grace is not yet worthy to see the face of the Most High, the angel guardian conducts it into the place of expiation, and there remains with her to produce for her all the assistance and consolations in his power. It is an opinion common among the holy doctors, says Father Rossangioli, that God, who will one day send forth his angels to assemble the elect, also sends them from time to time into purgatory, there to visit and console the suffering souls. No doubt there cannot be any relief more precious than the sight of the inhabitants of heaven, that blessed abode whether they will one day go to enjoy its glorious and eternal felicity. The revelations of St. Bridget are filled with examples of this nature, and the lives of several of the saints also furnish a great number. Venerable Sister Paula of St. Teresa, of whom we have already spoken above, had an extraordinary devotion towards the church suffering, for which she was rewarded here below with miraculous visions. One day, while saying a fervent prayer for this intention, she was transported in spirit into purgatory, where she saw a great number of souls plunged in flames. Close to them she saw our Savior, attended by his holy angels, who pointed out, one after the other, several souls which he desired to take to heaven, whether they ascended in transports of unutterable joy. At this sight the servant of God, addressing herself to the divine spouse, and said to him, O oh Jesus, why this choice among such a vast multitude? I have released, he designed to reply, to those who during life performed great acts of charity and mercy, and who have merited that I should fill my promise in their regard. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. In the life of the servant of God, Peter de Basto, we find an example which shows how the holy angels, even whilst they are watching over us upon earth, interest themselves in behalf of the souls in purgatory. And since we have mentioned the name of Brother de Basto, we cannot resist the desire to make known this admirable religious to our readers. His history is as interesting as it is edifying. Peter de Basto, brother coadjutor of the Society of Jesus, in whom his biographer calls the Alphonsus Rodriguez of Alabar, died in the odor of sanctity of Cochin, March 1, 1645. He was born in Portugal of the illustrious family of Machado, united in blood to all the nobility of the whole province between the Duraro and the Minho. The dukes of Passerano and Hixcar were among the members of his relatives, and the world held out to him a career of the most brilliant prospects, but God had reserved for him for himself, and had endowed him with the most marvelous spiritual gifts. While still a very little child, when taken to the church, he prayed for the Blessed Sacrament with the fervor of an angel. He believed that all the people saw as he did, with the eyes of the body, the legions of the celestial spirits in adoration near the altar and the tabernacle. And from that time forward, the Savior, hidden under the Eucharistic veil, became by excellence the center of his affections, and by the innumerable prodigies which characterize his long and holy life. It was there that, later, in the Divine Son, he discovered without veils the future and its most unforeseen details, it was there also that God showed him the mysterious symbols of the ladder of gold which united heaven and earth, supported by the tabernacle, and of the lily of purity shooting forth its roots, and drawing its nourishment from the flower of the wheat and of the elect, 
and the wine which alone can bring forth virgins. Towards his seventeenth year, thanks to that purity of heart and that strength of which the sacrament of the Eucharist was for him the inexhaustible source, Peter made at Lisbon a vow of perpetual chastity at the feet of Our Lady of Perpetual Succor. He did not yet, however, think of quitting the world, and some days later embarked for the Indies, and for two years followed the military profession. But at the end of that time, on the point of perishing by shipwreck, being tossed about at the mercy of the waves for five entire days, supported and saved by the Queen of Heaven and her Divine Son, who appeared to him, he promised to consecrate himself entirely to their service in the religious state for the remainder of his life. As soon as he returned to Goa, being then but nineteen years of age, he went and offered himself in the quality of a lay brother to the superiors of the Society of Jesus. Fearing that his name might procure for him some mark of distinction or esteem, he adopted henceforward that to the humble village where he had received baptism and was called simply Peter de Basto. It was a short time afterwards, during one of the trials of his novitiate, that this wonderful incident occurred, which is recorded in the annals of the society, which is so consoling for all the children of St. Ignatius. Brother Peter's novice master sent him on a pilgrimage with two young companions in the island of Salet, ordering them not to accept hospitality from any of the missionaries, but to beg from village to village for their daily bread and that night's lodging. One day, fatigued with their long journey, they met a humble family consisting of an old man, a young woman, and a little child who received them with great charity and pressed them to partake of a frugal repast. But at the moment of the departure, after having returned them a thousand thanks, when Peter de Basto, begging his host to tell them their names, wishing, no doubt, to recommend them to God, we are, replied the mother, the three founders of the Society of Jesus, and all these disappeared at the same instant. The whole religious life of this holy man until his death, that is to say, almost sixty-six years, was but a tissue of wondrous and extraordinary graces. But we must add that he merited them, and purchased them, that is to say, at the price of virtue, labors, and the most heroic sacrifices, charged by turns with care of the laundry, the kitchen, the door, and the college of Goa, of Tatakurin, of Carrillo, and of Chokin. Peter never sought to withdraw himself from the hardest labors, nor to reserve a little leisure time at the expense of his different offices that he might enjoy the delights of prayer. Serious infirmities, the sole cause of which was excessive labor, were, he said smilingly, is the most pleasant distractions. Moreover, abandoned, so to speak, to the fury of the demon, the servant of God enjoyed scarcely any repose. These spirits of darkness appear to him under the most hideous forms. They often beat him severely, especially at that hour each night when it was his custom. He interrupted his sleep to go and pray before the Blessed Sacrament. One day whilst traveling, his companions fled at the sound of a troop of formidable-looking men, horses, and elephants, who appeared approaching them with furious gestures. He alone remained calm, and when his companions expressed their astonishment that he had not manifested the least sign of fear, he replied, If God does not permit the demons to exercise their rage against us, what have we to fear? And if he gives them the permission, why then should we endeavor to escape their blows? He had only to invoke the Queen of Heaven, when she appeared immediately and put the infernal troops to flight. Often it seemed as though all was confusion, even to the very depths of his soul, and he found calm, peace, and victory only near his ordinary refuge, Jesus present in the Holy Eucharist. Loaded one day with outrages, which caused him some little disturbance, 
he prostrated himself at the foot of the altar and asked our divine Savior the gift of patience. When our Lord appeared to him covered with wounds, a purple mantle around his shoulders, a rope around his neck, a reed in his right hand, a crown of thorns upon his head, then addressing himself to Peter, he said, See what the true Son of God has suffered to teach men how to suffer? But we have not touched the point which we wish to illustrate by this holy life. I mean to say, the devotion of Peter de Basto towards the souls in purgatory, a devotion encouraged and seconded by his good angel guardian, notwithstanding his numerous labors. He daily recited the rosary for the dead. One day having forgotten it, he retired without having recited it. But scarcely had he fallen asleep, when he was awakened by his angel. My son, says the heavenly spirit, the souls in purgatory await the benefit of your daily alms. Peter rose instantly to fulfill the duty of piety. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 8 Consolations of Purgatory, The Angels, The Saints in Heaven if the holy angels interest themselves in behalf of the souls in purgatory in general, it is easy to understand that they have particular zeal for those of their clients. In the convent of Vercelli, where Blessed Emilia, a Dominican religious, was prioress, it was a point of the rule never to drink between meals unless with express permission of the superior. This permission the Blessed Prioress was not accustomed to accord, she advised her sisters to make that little sacrifice cheerfully in memory of the burning thirst which our Savior had endured for our salvation upon the cross. And to encourage them to do this, she suggested to them to confide those few drops of water to their guardian angels, that he might preserve them until the other life to temper the heat of purgatory. The following incident shows how agreeable this pious practice was to God. A sister named Cecilia Avangrada came one day to ask permission to refresh herself with a little water, for she was parched with thirst. My daughter, said the prioress, make this little sacrifice for the love of God and in consideration of purgatory. Mother, this sacrifice is not little. I am dying of thirst, replied the good sister. Nevertheless, although somewhat grieved, she obeyed the advice of her superior. This double act of obedience and mortification was precious in the sight of God, and Sister Cecilia soon received its reward. A few weeks later she died, and after three days she appeared resplendent in glory to Mother Emilia. O oh, Mother, she said, how grateful I am to you. I was condemned to a long purgatory for having had too great an affection for my family, and behold, after two days, I saw my guardian angel enter my prison, holding in his hand the glass of water which you caused me to offer a sacrifice to my divine spouse. He poured the water upon the flames which were devouring me. They were extinguished immediately, and I am delivered. I take my flight into heaven, where my gratitude will never forget you. It is thus that the angels of God console the souls in purgatory. It may be here asked how the saints and blessed already crowned in heaven can assist them. It is certain, says Father Rasangali, and such is the teaching of all the masters in theology, such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas, that the saints are very powerful in the respect by way of supplication, but not by satisfaction. In other words, the saints in heaven may pray for the souls and thus obtain from divine mercy a diminution of their sufferings. But they cannot satisfy for them nor pay their debts to divine justice. That is a privilege which God reserves to the church militant. 